You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Hey, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and I have to start by recapping the two pennant winning games, the two game sevens that we saw over the weekend. Doesn't get any better than that. A game seven in baseball, forget about it. Don't talk to me. Don't text me. I'm locked in. The best two words in team sports. Game 7. And we saw two great ones over the weekend. I'll start with Astros Rays. You gotta give the Astros a ton of credit. As much as we all hate the Astros, they fought back from 3-0 down to force a Game 7. They win two really close games in Games 4 and 5. Obviously, Game 5, the Correa walk-off. And then Game 6, Framber Valdez pitches a gem. So it sets up a Game 7. Lance McCullers versus Charlie Morton. The Rays in danger of joining the 4 Yankees as the only baseball team in history to blow a 3 nothing series lead. As much as I was rooting for the Rays in this series, it would have been nice if the 4 Yankees had some company. I'll tell you that. But Charlie Morton pitched the game of his life. We talk about these proven playoff performers... We need to start mentioning Charlie Morton in the same breath as guys like Bumgarner and El Duque and Christy Mathewson. Because what he's done in his playoff career is nothing short of incredible. This is from John Morosi, and I retweeted this. Charlie Morton in winner-take-all postseason games, is 4-0 with a .46 ERA. You can't be any better than that. Morton was dealing. It was a masterful performance. He had everything working. I mean, I'll tell you, I was scared when Cash pulled him. Brought in Nick Anderson. He stuck to the script. He stuck to the plan. He didn't manage with his gut. I don't like that. But I can't argue with results. Anderson got out of the little bit of a jam that Morton was in. First and third, two outs. The seventh inning, he works into some trouble. First and third, one out. But he gets Yuli Gurriel to ground into a double play. Anderson started the eighth, which surprised me. And I thought he was left on a little too long. Pete Fairbanks came in. Bases loaded. Two out. And he gave up the two RBI single to Correa. I mean, that scared me. But he got Bregman to strike out right after that. 
And in the ninth inning, there really wasn't much of anything. So give the Rays credit. The Astros had all the momentum in the world. They were motivated by two things. The prospect of coming back from 3-0 down and proving everyone who was calling them cheaters wrong. If they had won the pennant this year, the stigma that was surrounding them before, I don't want to say it goes away, but it certainly lessened. It proves that they didn't need to cheat. No one's saying that they didn't cheat, but they didn't need to cheat. They could get by without it. But they couldn't get the job done. The Rays bullpen shut them down. Charlie Morton shut them down. And these no-name players that no one had heard of before the season started lifted the Rays to victory on Saturday. Randy or Rosarena with another home run. Of course he was ALCS MVP. Did they even need to take a vote? Look, I usually don't like it when players on losing teams win those kind of awards. But even if the Astros had done the unthinkable, you could have given it to a Rosarena, and I wouldn't have had a problem with it. I mean, for God's sake, the guy hit 321 with four home runs. He had six RBIs. Five extra base hits. He had to be ALCS MVP, even if the Astros won. There's no question about that in my mind. Mike Zanino came up big with a home run. G-Man Choi had two hits. Give the Rays credit. They were the best team in the American League all year. You want to tell me they had an easy road to get here? You can tell me that. The Blue Jays lost because of terrible managing by Charlie Montoyo. The Yankees... If they weren't as good as the Rays, they made them work. At the very least. I mean, the reason the Rays won that series was because Mike Brasso hit a home run off an Araldis Chapman fastball that he had seen... About 50,000 times before that. That's the thing with Chapman. When he gets in trouble, it's just tunnel vision. Fastball, fastball, fastball. No off-speed stuff. Drives me nuts. He did it in 2016 with the Cubs. If memory serves, the Altuve pennant-winning home run last year was off a fastball. Don't quote me on that, though. But the Brasso home run was off a fastball that Chapman had thrown a million times to him before that pitch. That's just fact. And then the Rays faced an under 500 Astros team. Stormed out to a 3-0 series lead. I looked like a genius for saying they'd sweep. The Astros force a game seven. Maybe these weren't the most impressive series wins. Certainly more dramatic than you'd like. If you're a Rays fan, I mean, Nick had a great quote in the 2020 NFL mock draft. When your team is in that position, you don't want a nail biter. You want a dominant performance. You want a Seahawks-Broncos Super Bowl at MetLife Stadium. Not Niners-Broncos, like I said. My God, that was stupid. I mean, I understand that they weren't the most convincing wins in the world, but the Rays still did it. They took advantage of the Blue Jays' mistakes. They took advantage of the Yankees' mistakes. They slugged their way to a series win over the Astros. Give them credit. There's no question that the Tampa Bay Rays 
are the best team in the American League. And let me tell you, the team that they're going to go up against starting tomorrow is the best team in the National League. What's more impressive? Being down 3-0 and forcing a Game 7? Or being down 3-1 and winning the series? The answer is being down 3-1 and winning the series. That's what the Dodgers did. After the stupid opener strategy, I don't understand why you wouldn't just start Julio Urias. May didn't bother me too much. But then you pull him right away for Tony Gonsolin? Is Gonsolin really the guy who you want pitching in that spot? I mean, come on. That has to be Urias. I understand, young kid. Three days rest. I get all that. But he had to be the guy to start that game. That decision almost came back to bite Dave Roberts in the butt. There were a lot of Dodgers fans on Twitter saying, fire Roberts, get rid of him, stuff like that. But the Dodgers stormed back, manufactured a couple runs to tie it at two, The Braves take the lead right back. And this is why the Braves lost. And if I'm Brian Snitker, I didn't sleep at all last night. In fact, I kept my whole team up just berating them. I'm not kidding. The whole night, I would have spent degrading them and making them feel like the gum on the bottom of my shoe. That's what they deserved. You have runners on second and third. Nobody out. Blake Trinan had just come in to replace Gonsolin, who had nothing. Again, terrible decision by Dave Roberts. That can't be overstated. Roberts did try kind of hard to lose this game. I mean, one of his decisions paid off later, but I'll get into that in a minute. You've got second and third, nobody out. The infield comes in, Nick Markakis at bat. A fly ball scores Swanson. A hit scores Swanson and Riley. The Braves have an opportunity to blow this game wide open. Five to two? I don't think the Braves are blowing that. And then the most asinine base running you'll ever see in your life. You run on contact with the infield in, which is incredibly stupid. Never do that. Justin Turner with a Superman-like tag on Swanson. So that's one out. Then the presence of mind to fire to third to get Austin Riley out. So instead of having second and third, one out, you had Marcakis on first, two out. That's one of the worst base running jobs you'll ever see. It's right up there with Jeff Supon in a playoff game with the Cardinals about 15 years ago. It's right up there with I want to say Nick Johnson in Game 1 of the 03 World Series. He got thrown out at third. He got picked off. The list of things that the Braves did wrong there is endless. It's literally endless. Never run on contact with the infield in. Wait to see that the ball gets by the infield. I don't care if they were told to do that. Don't do it. For God's sake, do not do it. And then Riley, 
You have to get to third if you're Riley. If Swanson gets into a rundown, if you're the trailing runner, you have to get to third. I remember the Astros doing that against the Yankees last year. Getting into rundowns and getting runners on third. And I think second also. It was actually kind of interesting to watch. Had a perfect view in the Astros dugout after that. Everyone was high-fiving afterwards. If you're Riley, you have to get to third. You see the rundown. Just make a beeline to third. Yes, you're leaving Swanson out there to die. I understand that. But you need to have a runner on third. If Swanson's going to do something stupid, you know, that's not your issue, Riley. Just get to third. Stop the bleeding as much as you can. Instead, Riley was dancing and he got thrown out at third. Of course he did. What surprised me more than anything was that Nick Markakis didn't try to take second. I thought we were going to see a triple play. I really did. I'm not saying that would have been the right decision, but you want to talk about running yourselves out of an inning? That's what the Braves did there. That's why the Braves lost. The Braves didn't lose because of the great decision by Roberts to pinch hit Kike Hernandez for uh, Jock Peterson. They didn't lose because Chris Martin, the former Yankee, Gave up a home run to Cody Ballinger. Great moment. They lost because of that rundown. I don't know what Pache would have done if he got up to bat with second and third one out. We'll never know. I don't know what Acuna would have done. We'll never know. But let's say both those runners score. It's called scoring position for a reason. The Braves are up 5-2. The Dodgers won 4-3. So the Bellinger home run at that point becomes irrelevant. The Dodgers still need another run. The Braves have had some bad moments in the postseason. Blowing the 2-0 series lead in 96 which I didn't think they would do here, but they did. Countless playoff games with empty seats at Turner Field. How about Brooks Conrad? In Game 3 of the 2010 NLDS against the Giants, committing three errors. The 2012 NL Wild Card game. The game that the Cardinals won because Sam Holbrook didn't know what an infield fly was. Granted, that wasn't the Braves' fault, but still, that's a heartbreaking loss. That loss yesterday, the way they lost it, the Bellinger home run, the Hernandez pinch hit home run, becoming the first player since Troy O'Leary, in 2003, to have a pinch hit home run in a game seven. Coincidentally, both of those home runs were in an NLCS. This is a really tough loss if you're a Braves fan. Like I said, I don't think Snicker got much sleep last night. I know I wouldn't have if I was him. I would have spent the entire night just walking all around the hotel. I mean, congrats to the Dodgers, I guess. Coming back from 3-1 down, they were the best team in the National League. The best team in each league is meaning in this World Series. That's the way it should be. But I'll tell you, the Braves really should have won that game yesterday. That's an infuriating loss. I'm not going to get into the World Series today. I'll save that for tomorrow. 
I do want to get into college football, though. I'm not going to get too into the NFL. Nothing earth-shattering happened. A lot of people were making a big deal out of the Dolphins being a half game up on the Patriots. It's week six. Okay? A lot of time for things to change. I think it's very likely that the Dolphins will stay in second place in the AFC East, but yeah, I didn't think the Patriots would be that good this year. That doesn't surprise me. The Browns laid an egg? Yeah, you know what? They went up against a great Steelers team. A Steelers team that has a case for being the best team in football. Roethlisberger has come back and has looked amazing. I mean, people got on Baker Mayfield for that performance. He was playing hurt, and he was going up against a great defense. He should have been better, but... Guys, he's still really, really good. I'll tell you what. If you're ready to give up on him, I'll take him as a Jets fan. You can have Darnold, I'll have Mayfield. We'll see who wins more games. The Giants and Falcons getting their first win. So the Jets take the lead in the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes. Great. Fantastic. That's a good thing. I mean, if you're a Giants or Falcons fan, be happy that you won. You have a right to be happy that you won, but you didn't beat any world beaters. The Giants nearly lost that game. If it wasn't for Tate Crowder taking advantage of an asinine Kyle Allen fumble, the Giants never take the lead. And for God's sake, Ron Rivera kicked the extra point. The Titans kicked the extra point yesterday, and they won the game. I understand, Riverboat Ron, you're trying to win, but you're going up against an anemic Giants offense. Trust your defense. The Giants didn't win that game as much as Washington lost it. I'll tell you that. And the Falcons, yeah, they took advantage of a dreadful Vikings team. Kirk Cousins is not looking good. Dalvin Cook is hurt. Yeah, bad situation in Minnesota. But where are the big stories? You know, I just summarized them all really, really quickly. I can't go in depth on them. There's nothing there. There's no substance there. There's no meat there. I can't do a deep dive into those stories that really aren't stories. But I can do deep dives into the big college football games that happened on Saturday. And I'll start with Georgia, Alabama. I picked the Crimson Tide to win this game, but that's because I thought they'd be motivated because Nick Saban wasn't going to coach. It turns out that his positive coronavirus test was a false positive. So he was on the sideline on Saturday. Good for him. And you know what? Alabama was motivated by that, and they beat a great Georgia team. Mac Jones had the best game of his life. Completed 75% of his passes, threw for over 400 yards, four touchdowns. Him, Najee Harris, Devontae Smith, and Jalen Waddell sliced and diced This great Georgia defense. They put up 41 points on one of the best defenses in the nation. I'll tell you, I was flip-flopping between that game and Game 7 of the ALCS. And I couldn't believe what I was watching when I had Georgia-Alabama on. Again, I thought Alabama would win, but I didn't think they'd drop 41. That was a fantastic performance by Alabama. Mac Jones is in the Heisman conversation. 
He's not going to get it. It's going to be Trevor Lawrence. I'm assuming nothing crazy happens. But that was a great game by him. And you know what? The defense for Alabama stepped up also. Stetson Bennett did not look good. I mean, it's a great story. Local kid, grew up in Georgia. Grew up wanting to be the Bulldogs starting quarterback. Had to work his tail off to get there. But he's just not that great. I mean, I'll tell you. With the exception of the 82-yard pass to James Cook, he didn't impress me. And the Bulldogs' offense didn't impress me. Zamir White was good, but he only ran the ball ten times. Kendall Milton was really good, but he only ran the ball six times. Georgia and Alabama were tied. Headed into the locker room at half. It was tied at 24. When the third quarter hit, Georgia just died. They gave up 21 unanswered points. Because they fell behind there, they abandoned the ground game. I understand that's what you have to do, but I don't think you can trust Stetson Bennett In that spot. Great win for Alabama. They are by far and away the second best team in the nation. And this wasn't even a good loss for Georgia. If this was a close game, you know, instant classic. You lose on the final drive of the game. Okay. You know, that's a respectable loss. That's a loss that the committee is going to look at and say, you know what, that's not a bad loss. We're not going to ding them too much in their quest to make the CFP. Now, there's no way Georgia makes it. None. As it stands right now, they're at four. But OSU hasn't played yet. The Big Ten hasn't started play yet. Once the Buckeyes start, Georgia's going to fall out of the national title picture. It's just that simple. Moving on now to the upsets that happened on Saturday. And I'll go chronologically. That means that I'm going to start with Kentucky destroying Tennessee. Kentucky and Tennessee have played each other a lot throughout both their histories. I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. Tennessee has dominated that rivalry. It hasn't even been close. No one gave Kentucky much of a shot in this game It was at Knoxville. This was viewed as a mediocre Kentucky team. Tim Couch isn't there anymore. They don't have a quarterback with a strong arm anymore like Couch was. Terry Wilson is more of an option-style quarterback. Tennessee was expected to destroy Kentucky here. That didn't happen. The Wildcats massacred the Volunteers here. 34-7. The first win that Kentucky's had at Neyland Stadium since 1984. Their most lopsided win in that rivalry since 1935. This wasn't even the offense being great. They had a couple decent drives late. But the reason Kentucky won was their defense. Jameen Davis was all over the place. 
He had 10 tackles and a pick six. Kelvin Joseph had a pick six. Tennessee couldn't get their passing game going to save their lives. They trotted out three quarterbacks. Jarek Warantano, Harrison Bailey, and J.T. Shrout. No one's going to be mistaking those guys for Peyton Manning anytime soon. I mean, their run game was good. Eric Gray and Ty Chandler each got theirs. Gray rushed for just under 130 yards, and Ty Chandler had a touchdown. But you can't throw two pick sixes and expect to win. You can't throw two pick sixes in a game where you're going up against an unranked opponent. This was a humiliating loss for the Volunteers. I know my father was happy because he went to Vanderbilt. This was a tough game, if you're a Volunteers fan. Moving on now to another SEC upset, and that is South Carolina beating Auburn 32-22. You know, Bo Nix is a guy who got some buzz early on as a potential Heisman candidate. Maybe not at the Lawrence level or the Fields level or something like that, but there were some rumblings that he could maybe contend, for lack of a better word. But I gotta tell you, This kid has had three straight underwhelming games. He destroys Kentucky. Good for him. Can't get anything going against Georgia. If you want to win the Heisman, you've got to beat the good teams. Against Arkansas, he was solid, but I wanted to see him use his arm more. He only attempted 28 passes. In this game... He attempted 47. But you know what? I can see why he wasn't throwing the ball that much. Because he threw three interceptions in this game. I mean, Auburn was in a good spot. Early on in this game, they were up 9-0 after one. They were up 16-7 at one point. Then they just collapsed. Nix was a turnover machine. He's good with his legs, but not with his arm. I mean, you don't need Nix to be that great with his legs. You have Tank Bigsby. A guy who's had back-to-back 100-yard games. He has talent. Nix just has to throw it. I don't like the setup of this Auburn team. When I watch them play, they just don't impress me. I understand in college, you can have running quarterbacks and be successful. That's fine. I get that. But when you have a talented running back like Bigsby, in a perfect world, you'd have a strong-armed quarterback. That's what Knicks should be able to do. Unfortunately for Tigers fans, he can't. I mean, I give South Carolina credit for sticking with their ground-and-pound approach. Their quarterback, Colin Hill, really isn't that great. He's not awful, but he's not going to be playing in too many NFL games. They have a solid two-headed monster at running back, Kevin Harris and Deshaun Fenwick. And they both got going yesterday. Harris is more of the lead back, and you saw that on Saturday. He had 25 carries for 83 yards. That's not that good, but he had two touchdowns. That makes up for it. Fenwick made the most of his 12 carries. He had 68 yards. That's just under 6 yards a carry. Good win for South Carolina. 
They have a good coach in Will Muschamp. He's not great, but he's a solid coach. Gus Malzahn is a better coach than him, but on Saturday, he wasn't. The biggest upset on Saturday, though, was FSU beating UNC 31-28. I never thought UNC was that great. They have a quarterback in Sam Howell who has talent. And if developed properly, I could see him turning into something in the NFL. But I never put them in that Clemson class or Alabama class. The Notre Dame class. The Georgia class. I thought they were massively overrated. I mean, Mac Brown should be commended for what he's done with the Tar Heels. Coming back after a pretty messy breakup from Texas. And he has the Tar Heels looking good, but I didn't think they were good enough to be the fifth ranked team in the nation. And it showed on Saturday. That game was more of a blowout than the score shows. FSU at one point was up 24 to nothing. They had just returned a Sam Howell pass for a pick six. Very athletic play by Joshua Kando. But then the Tar Heels tried to rally. After falling down 24-0, they outscored the Seminoles 28-7. But ultimately, this is going to sound really cliche, but it's the truth. You've got to play a full 60 minutes if you're going to win. It doesn't matter if you're the better team. UNC is a better team than FSU. Even though I'm not high on the Tar Heels, they're better than the Seminoles. Look, I give Howell credit for rallying the troops in the second half. I like that leadership quality. That does speak volumes to me. And it wouldn't surprise me if he turned into a solid player in the NFL. But as far as this year goes... I don't think UNC ever should have been mentioned in the same breath as the big boys. FSU, from the outset, looked like the better team. They couldn't stop that option offense led by Jordan Travis and LaDamian Webb. But if you can't beat FSU, you never should have been mentioned in the same breath as the big boys. This isn't a bad UNC team. It's very good, but it's not great. It never should have been fifth in the uh, nation. I'll tell you that right now. I do want to preview tonight's two NFL games, and I gotta tell you, I'm kind of surprised how the NFL did this. Not necessarily that they moved Chiefs Bills to Monday, but that they didn't make it the true Monday night football game. This game is on Fox and the NFL Network, not ESPN. What would you rather watch? Chiefs Bills or Cardinals Cowboys? You'd rather watch Chiefs Bills, of course. You'd rather watch the two 4 and one teams go at it. And I'll tell you, this game is going to be an offensive explosion. The Chiefs defense is solid, but Josh Allen will still get his... What a great quarterback Josh Allen has turned into. Some people gave me heat for putting Allen over Darnold. 
in 2018 on my big board. I look pretty smart right about now. But one thing that doesn't get talked about enough is how good that Bills offensive line is. Their tackles are amazing. Daryl Williams and Deion Dawkins. The center, Mitch Morse, is really good. Their guard play could be better. Quinton Spain, Cody Ford, and Brian Winters aren't world beaters or anything. And even then, Spain is questionable with a foot injury. We talk about how good Allen is. The offensive line deserves a ton of credit also. And they've helped produce a really good running game. Obviously, Allen gets his with his legs. But Devin Singletary is averaging just about four yards a carry. Only one touchdown, which I don't like. But Singletary is a solid back in this league. The Bills have good weapons on offense for Allen to work with. Stephon Diggs, Cole Beasley, John Brown, Gabriel Davis. This is a scary Bills offense. They do need to be respected. The one thing that I'm not crazy about with the Bills is their defense was supposed to be great this year, and it hasn't been. It's been solid. It hasn't been great. Guys like Ed Oliver... And Teron Johnson and Tremaine Edmonds, A.J. Klein, Tyrell Dodson, they have not played well this year. I mean, granted, Starlo Tulele and E.J. Gaines opting out didn't help matters. And it's not like they are without playmakers on defense. They still have Jerry Hughes, they still have Jordan Poyer and his drop-dead gorgeous wife. Mario Addison has had a good season. Tredavious White is one of the best corners in the league. It's not a bad Bills defense, but it's not a great Bills defense. And when you look at the Chiefs, you already know who they are on offense. I'm not going to spend too much time on them. Mahomes... Edwards Hilaire, no bell yet. Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, Miko Hardman. Um, the offensive line is great. Eric Fisher, Mitchell Schwartz, Austin Ritter. Their offense is stacked. You don't need me to tell you that. But the defense doesn't get a lot of attention. I understand with Patrick Mahomes as your quarterback, that's going to happen. But this is a solid Chiefs defense. Rashad Fenton has had a really good season so far. Chris Jones has been great. Their defensive line is really good. Mike Pinnell putting it all together. Tershawn Wharton, Derek Noddy. They have some big playmakers and guys like the Honey Badger, Frank Clark, Daniel Sorensen, Juan Thornhill. From the top down, the Chiefs are stacked. All in all, I think the Chiefs are going to win it. But the Bills will make them work. This is going to be a great game. Moving on now to Cardinals-Cowboys. And much like the Cardinals took advantage of a putrid defense last week in the Jets, I think they're going to do the same thing here. This is an offense that maybe hasn't been as explosive as we all thought it could be, but it's still really good. Kyler Murray is getting it done. He's turning into a really, really good player. Kenyon Drake has had a good season. DeAndre Hopkins has been fantastic. I mean, here's how crazy DeAndre Hopkins has been. 
And this is a great job by Kingsbury. DeAndre Hopkins has 45 catches this year. Chase Edmonds and Larry Fitzgerald are tied for second with 18 each. You add those two together, you get 36. The Cardinals have done a fantastic job of force-feeding DeAndre Hopkins. Last year, the Cardinals' offense was spread out. A bunch of guys were getting theirs. Fitzgerald, Christian Kirk, Kenyon Drake, David Johnson. Now, it's very Hopkins-centric. That's a great job by Kingsbury in altering his playbook to make sure that one of the best wide receivers in the NFL is predominantly featured. And the fact that I need to single out that as a good job of coaching is insane. That seems like common sense. You feature your best players. Well, as we've seen with Bill O'Brien, a lot of coaches out there aren't that smart. The offensive line is solid. DJ Humphreys, Mason Cole, Kevin Beecham, Justin Pugh is a really good pass blocker. Same thing with Justin Murray, who's filling in for the injured J.R. Sweezy. The offensive line is really good. You take a look at the defense, though, and that's where the Cardinals are vulnerable. They're getting it done. They're finding ways to get it done. But they really don't have any big playmakers. Chandler Jones... No, he only has one sack this year. The Cardinals only have three players, according to Pro Football Focus, with a grade over 70. Charles Washington, Devon Kennard, and Chris Banjo. But like I said, the Cardinals are getting it done. 13th in the league in total yards allowed per game. Sixth in the league in passing yards allowed per game. Eighth in the league in points allowed per game. This is a great job by Vance Joseph. He deserves a ton of credit for what the Cardinals have done on defense. And when you look at the Cowboys, you don't need to look much further than seeing Andy Dalton under center instead of Dak Prescott. I like Prescott a lot. I think Prescott is probably one of the 10 best quarterbacks in the NFL. And even though Andy Dalton is a solid backup, led the Cowboys to a good win last week over the Giants, the Cowboys are going to suffer. Now the one plus is that the Cowboys have a ton of players that can help Dalton. Ezekiel Elliott, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, C.D. Lamb, Dalton Schultz. And the offensive line is really, really good. Not as great as in years past, but still really good. Zach Martin is one of the best offensive linemen in the league. Connor Williams is emerging into a solid guard in this league. Joe Looney is good. The tackles concern me a little bit. Obviously, no Tyron Smith, but Brandon Knight has been good. Terrence Steele has struggled, though. That's what scares me. Defensively, again, the Cowboys are absolutely dreadful. Some Cowboys fans are calling for Mike Nolan to be fired now, and I don't blame them. They're outside the top 20 in every major defensive category. 
And the scary thing is, they actually have some solid players on defense. Demarcus Lawrence, Alden Smith, Xavier Woods, Jalen Smith. Even a guy like Daryl Worley, I think, is solid. Mike Nolan has done a terrible job. He is going to be one and done in Dallas. I think the Cardinals are going to take advantage of this putrid Cowboys defense just like they took advantage of the anemic Jets defense last week. I picked the Cardinals as one of my three picks. I'm one and one so far. Let's see if I can go two and one. Cardinals are going to win tonight. You know, it's kind of funny. Right after I posted... The Jets instant recap yesterday, I saw the news that they pulled off a trade. Now, it's not an earth-shattering trade or anything, but it's a solid one. It's one they had to make. And that is Steve McClendon and a seventh-round pick in 2023 going to the Buccaneers for their 6th rounder in 2022. McClendon was a locker room leader, actually played well this year. It's kind of funny, the defensive line has actually been good for the Jets. John Franklin Myers, Foley Fatukasi, Quinnen Williams... And McClendon. Now, Henry Anderson has been completely useless, but still, that's four guys on that defensive line that are solid. And they can turn into key pieces on the Jets going forward. But at the end of the day, McClendon just doesn't fit what the Jets need. He's 34 years old. He doesn't have a long-term future on the Jets, obviously. The Jets lost with McClendon. They're going to lose without him. And they traded him to a Buccaneers team that needed to replace Vita Vea. While McClendon isn't going to be anywhere close to Vea in terms of dominance, he'll be really good. He gets to be reunited with Todd Bowles. And you know what? Maybe he can end his career with a Super Bowl ring. That'd be nice. This is an even trade for both teams. Makes perfect sense on both sides. There are a couple hockey extensions that I want to talk about. The first one is the Bruins locking up Matt Grizzlick for four years at 14.75 mil. It's funny. I can't pronounce anything else, but I can pronounce Grizzlick. G-R-Z-E-L-C-Y-K. Yeah, he pronounces it Grizzlick. Grizzlick is a solid defenseman. Nothing great, nothing terrible. Defensive defenseman, but he does get 20 points a year. Plays a big role for the Bruins on their second defensive pair. And since the Bruins lost Tory Krug, he's going to be asked to step up in a big way. The Bruins had to lock him up long term. I'm not crazy about this move, though. It is an overpay. In a perfect world, he wouldn't be getting over three and a half mil a year. That doesn't work for me. Offensively, he did nothing in the playoffs. I understand why the Bruins did this. They couldn't afford to lose another defenseman. I understand that he was an RFA. So odds are they weren't going to lose him. But still, you have to sign him. It was a necessary move, but it should have been done cheaper. 
Moving on now to the Coyotes locking up Christian Fisher for two years at two mil. And Fisher, a couple years ago, looked like he had a ton of potential. Had 33 points in 79 games. But the year after, he took a major step back, 18 points in 71 games. Last year, 9 points in 56 games. Only had one assist in the playoffs. It seems like he's never really gonna put it all together. But one mil a year for a guy who may have something left in the tank isn't the end of the world. He's 23 years old. It makes sense to give him one last shot. I don't hate this move, but make no mistake about it. This is the last chance for him. If he doesn't contribute this year on the Coyotes' third line, he's never going to put it together. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying that George Hendricks simply lost that sun-blown pop-up.